Good evening, everyone. Good evening, lots of lovely, familiar faces. Um, thank you all for weathering the weather today, this interesting weather day. Um, welcome to the gallery and to the exhibition R.B. Kitai, um, Collages and Prints, 1964 to 1975, which will be on view through January 18th. I'm going to read my introduction um, for a reason you will find out um, shortly. <laughs> um, my name is Elizabeth East. I'm a director at L.A. Louvre Gallery, and it was my privilege to um, help curate this exhibition. Uh, this had, would not have been possible, however, but for the kind assistance of many colleagues. I'm going to start the evening off by actually acknowledging some of my co-workers, um, and they are um, Nicola, Koya, sorry, Nicola Koya, uh, Kate Callahan, Ashley Parks, Ella Anderson, uh, Stephen Kugelberg, Christina Carlos, Jacob Souza, as well as my co-directors, uh, Peter Goulds, uh, Lisa John, and Kimberly Davis. Before I introduce the speakers, I would like to say something about uh, the history of Kitai and the relationship he and his work have to the gallery. Um, he was part of two very important early shows in the gallery. One was called This Knot of Life in 1979, and uh, the second was The British Picture in 1988. We had our first solo show um, in 2003. Um, it was, again, my privilege to work directly with Kitai um, at that time. He had moved to Los Angeles in 1997, and so the exhibition we presented was of recent work, um, paintings and drawings that he had made here in LA. Um, that followed on 10 years later with a show in 2013, which was a survey show of, again, of paintings and drawings from around 1990 to 2007. So, with this show, we are kind of going back in time. Um, this is the earliest work that um, we have shown here, again from 1964 to 1975. And what's interesting about it, before I started working on this show, I was somewhat familiar with the prints, these beautiful, extraordinary prints, um, which may be familiar to some of you. Um, I was not so acquainted with the collages, which actually played a very important role in the creation of these prints. All of these prints were made in London. Um, they were made uh, in conjunction with the master printmaker, um, Chris Prada, uh, to whom Kitai had been introduced by the Scottish artist, Eduardo Palozzi. Um, Chris had formed Kelpra Studios and was making um, very exciting screen prints. They were large, beautiful colors, rich, um, lots of exploration could take place. And other artists at that time were working with Chris, including artists such as Bridget Riley, Patrick Caulfield, and Richard Hamilton. Um, anyway, um, the debt that I owe um, for introducing me to these collages is actually the person I'm going to introduce first this evening, and, and that is Tracy Bartley, who you might have guessed, uh, is the center of the threesome here. Um, Tracy studied art and conservation in Canada, receiving her master's degree from Queen's University in Kingston, Ottawa. She came to Los Angeles as a graduate intern at the Getty Conservation Institute and subsequently became a project coordinator. It was at the Getty that she met Kitai. And he had as I mentioned earlier, just moved to LA as well. And uh, uh, Tracy went on to become his studio manager and personal assistant and uh, stayed with Kitai in that role until he died in 2007. After that time, she was named director of the RB Kitai Estate. With experience in estate planning, studio management, and the formation and operation of artist endowed foundations, uh, Tracy also currently consults with artists and estates about issues of legacy. And uh, most recently, Tracy has become an associate of the Appraisers Association of America. So welcome, Tracy. Uh, secondly, I'd like to introduce the gentleman to my immediate right, um, Bruce Gunther. Uh, Bruce is an art historian and an independent curator. He is a specialist in post-war American and European art. 
Uh, he has held several senior curatorial positions, including at the Portland Art Museum, Oregon, the Seattle Art Museum, MCA Chicago, and the Orange County Museum of Art. He is a popular, popular lecturer on contemporary art, and he is a frequent juror for regional and national exhibitions, and serves as a peer panelist for the GSA Art in Architectural program. Bruce has written extensively on art, um, covering the last 100 years, including Michael C. Spafford, Epic Works, 2018, Paper, Charles Arnoldi, 2017, Lee Kelly in 2010, Clement Greenberg, a critic's collection in 2001 with Karen Wilkin, Tony DeLapp, 2000, Joe Good, 1997, and The Essential Gesture in 1994, to name a few. He currently serves as an adjunct curator of special exhibitions for the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education, Port sorry, Education in Poland, where in 2018 he curated the exhibition R.B. Kitai, A Jew, etc., etc., which was a survey of the artist's paintings and drawings from 1990 to, through 2007. So welcome, Bruce. And uh, last but not least, um, uh, Jonathan Griffin, a fellow uh, Brit living in Los Angeles. Uh, Jonathan is a freelance uh, writer and art critic. He is a contributing editor for Freeze magazine. And he has written for many publications. In fact, I tried to actually memorize all of them. <laughs> sort of reminded me of this old game show in England growing up, but anyway. Um, Art Review, Carla, Apollo, The Art Newspaper, Flash Art, Aperture, Art in America, The New York Times, The Guardian, The Telegraph, Modern Painters, Tate, etc. Royal Academy Magazine, Wallpaper, Text, Zur Kunst, Los Angeles Review of Books, Easter Borneo, and it actually goes on. Um, he has contributed essays to numerous exhibition catalogues as well, including um, monographs by artists Armin Bowen, Liam Everett, Hernan Bass, Ross Chisholm, and others. And in 2016, Paper Monument published his book titled On Fire. Um, I should also mention a few curatorial projects, including um, Philip Lay for No Soul for Sale at Tate Modern in 2010, in conjunction with Moose, and uh, the group exhibition Cogwheels Carved in Wood at Night Gallery, which included the paintings of Derek Boscher alongside some younger artists. Um, so, rather long-winded, but in fact, that was an edited version. Welcome to all our panelists, and thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Um, thanks for joining us uh, on this winter evening in, uh, as a avowed east side of what I like to call the tsunami zone. <laughs> I'd love to thank uh, Ale Luva and especially Elizabeth for uh, bringing us all together um, to talk about this fantastic exhibition of, of work uh, by R. B. Kitai. It's uh, an intimate, witty, personal, uh, and profoundly thoughtful exhibition, and uh, I hope that we can do it justice with a conversation tonight. Thanks to, of course, to Tracy and Bruce uh, for, for bringing the real expertise uh, to the table today. I've um, long been convinced that collage was the, the most important medium of the 20th century. Um, it changed forever the relative status of the real and the represented. Uh, the flat and the volumetric, the imminent and the transcendent. Um, ultimately, attempting to integrate art and life through breaching the autonomous, timeless space of the picture plane with unmodified, one-to-one -one scale fragments from contemporary existence. Even if for Kitai it was a relatively minor digression um, considered with, within the arc of his whole earth, and a medium which itself he never exhibited and only really used as a means to an end, a stepping stone to um, another relatively minor medium, uh, screen printing, I 
argue um, that it plays an absolutely fundamental role in the development of his ideas about fragmentation, hybridity, uh, narrative, the construction of meaning, uh, composition or decomposition, um, and even ideas about disruption, displacement, and trauma. For me, these works um, uh, are keys that unlock a lot of Kitai's uh, subsequent work, even if they seem refreshingly atypical um, from what we, we know of his output. Um, but let's start with the basics. Um, I don't know how much everyone knows about the background to this um, exhibition or, or, or the context that Kitai was making these work in. But, but um, Tracy, please, if you're able to tell us a bit about who Chris Prater was um, and uh, how Kitai came to work with him at Kelper Studios. Absolutely. So Chris and his wife, Rose Kelly, were printing in London in the 50s, mostly commercially, as screen printing was coming and being discovered by artists, a small circle found them and were working with them as well, as Elizabeth mentioned. And in the early 60s, ICA approached Richard Hamilton, uh, asking him uh, how they might raise some money as a fundraiser. And Hamilton suggested a portfolio of screen prints produced by Kelper Studios that would um, be for sale. So it was developed a list of artists that Hamilton put together was submitted. Uh, ICA saw this as an affordable way to make some money <laughs> and, and went from there. So Kitai was on that initial list that was brought to them. Uh, I think there were 18 artists in total and it was actually was Pelosi who did the formal introduction to Prater as he'd been working with him already. What sort of um, status did screen print making have in the fine art world at this it, time? It wasn't regarded by most people as fine art. So it was coming out of this commercial, this idea, and it actually one of the prints in collage even includes the idea of what is an original print. And the idea of a photo reproduction had been deemed not original. So if photography was involved, it was separate. So these artists were trying to push that in a different direction and show that it could be. And, and, and that period finds um, a very interesting parallel development in America, where screen printing was the immediate sign possibility for commercial life from grocery stores to department stores and, and car dealerships. And it becomes um, through photomechanical transfer rather than the traditional cutting of a, of a film and adhering it to the cloth. The photomechanical transfer technology arrives. And in America, we looked to Andy Warhol as the first sort of person who picks it up in a successful way to begin to make images about culture and his, in his art as an art form, not simply as an advertisement for shoes. He introduces Rauschenberg, Johns, and a series of artists to it at the same moment that this is happening in, or if not a little earlier actually, probably in the late 50s. And it's part and parcel of how this validation of a commercial technology enters, for the first time, uh, a, the art making vocabulary. And, in, and at a level of, as these uh, few prints that are on view but available to see, show it as superb technology, technique. And Prater was known as a master stencil cutter. So they, they did use the cutting technique with many of these, and that was why so many mm -hmm. artists were drawn, because he was able to do the cutting that could create these complex images. Do you think an audience at the time would have read it, read works like this uh, as being in a kind of commercial language? Do you think I think so. I mean, because you know, the, the, the print world was a world that was dominated by etching and lithography. And lithography comes close to approximating it. But the beauty of a screen print and silkscreen is that is there is a very dense layer of ink that's put down because it's a pressure pushing through and laying down the color on top. Whereas lithography and etching has a wet matrix and the ink settles in and moves in. A silk screen gave you the possibility of the slight physicality and the eye picks it up when you're looking at it on the wall. So that at times you look at these and you think, is this collaged? 
is there a, an, a, an applied element because the, there's a crisp little edge uh -huh. that catches the light and that, that sort of helps you understand it as a silk screen. So it would have confused the eye of print collectors and the public would have been, it would have felt familiar but somehow more vigorous than lithography which tends to sink mm -hmm. as a color. It's like uh, acrylic or gouache rather than watercolor, which yes. yeah. Um, I read somewhere, and this is sort of unverified, that, um, that it wasn't Prater who suggested that these artists submit collages to him for their um, what would you call it, paste ups, or you know. Um, uh, could you say something a bit about how the kind of technical process worked between the artist and the printmaker? In, in the beginning for Kitai, they were very controlled and he would create these collage work independently of Prater. And there's a wonderful, the archive at Pallant House has the letters that Kitai wrote to, to Chris with the detailed instructions and at UCLA in our archive we have the responses that, uh, that Prater sent back. So you get this wonderful dialogue going. But Kitai did manage them. They came to, to Prater as collage work until in the middle of the Mahler series, which was a series that he began in the mid-60s, when he was feeling more comfortable and saw the value of what Chris could bring and a little bit more freedom and started sending envelopes of clippings, which also corresponded to the fact that he was coming to the US. He did a year at Berkeley teaching and then a year at UCLA. And so to not interrupt this process, it was very difficult to mail a large collage. <laughs> but the envelopes would, would arrive. So I'm curious then, because inside of several of the prints, the same image will appear, but sometimes a different scale. Yes. So it isn't a reusing of a particular screen that's created from the object. It's a remaking of an image that Kitai exactly. had to, and, and he would have pr uh, photographic prints made for himself uh, of images that he, whether they were from a painting he did, there are a lot of, of pieces that come from work that he did, um, or from something he found, and then would tear them up. There's right. actually is a sketchbook in the archive of collage work that's just these black and white photos that have been torn and put into a book. So that was very much part yeah, of the process. So it's, it's part and parcel of the, the poetics of accumulating and constructing image bases that are a new vocabulary. Yes. Yeah. And having this relationship with his gallery, Marlboro, that was promoting, they published most of the prints. Uh, they were able to provide him with these reproductions and he would instruct them that he wanted a, an eight by 10 of this scale and they would provide it for him so that he could put it in. So ah. they, they really facilitated through Marlboro Graphics the process. Right, and this is an important point too that Marlboro was underwriting the production of all yes. these works. So Kitto was more or less oblivious as to how much his experiments were costing. There was a freedom there that caught up with him a little bit in the late 60s where uh, he was starting to get very complex compositions. He was having a Rose Prater source vintage World War II wallpapers to use in the prints. So they started to get very, very expensive. I mean, this piece immediately behind you uh, is you guys should check it out later if you haven't already, but it's already it's printed on a specialist paper, this kind of uh, Hessian effect. But then there's two um, collaged elements. Do you know what the sources of these are? I mean, or, or what material they are? Are they silk screened as well? Or no, they, they, would be, they would be photographic reproductions, the bottom right, definitely. And so I, it's awkward for you to look yes. right behind and then, you. So then that production process as well would be very involved with Prater's staff assembling these. Right. In effect, collage again from a collage. <laughs> right. The, the black and white head is obviously a printed of an image that appears yeah, in, in another print. It's a game one version. can play going yes. around the room and seeing where they're all repeated because they do show up over and over again. Um, and the, and the, the type of paper is interesting because it's a later manifestation, it's a later print, and this kind of paper is introduced to the printmaking world and the, not typically screen printed except for commercial uses right. because it's a Japanese paper with a, a, a different element of fiber or different fiber right. laid into it, which changes the ink underneath it. So three of the works in here in the prints have this shadow effect where Kitai and Prater played with the way the ink 
saturated or changed as it went onto the surface where the different poricities of the paper changed. Which was also affected by him coming with a complete collage. So it, during the photo reproduction process, would, a collage would create a shadow, whereas if Kitai submitted the pieces that could be done independently, you wouldn't get that effect. That's so you right. You can also tell if you look carefully which ones were done which way. Mm. Um, I, Kitai said that he sort of saw himself as the uh, composer and Prater was the conductor and the studio was the orchestra. Um, I'm really interested in this sort of apparent uh, surrender of authorship um, in the uh, work. Where well, yes and no. I mean, um, I, I question for someone who was certainly Catholic in his life, but you know, strict in his art. How how much surrendering there is. There are uh, copious letters between them where they're trying to get the agreement on just what the shape is. But for this technology, this level of uh, simple technology, a uh, step away from potato printing, actually, um, you sort of need a hand and then someone who quality controls. But the choices, uh, you know, how much did Prater talk about color? There's a kind of a, there's a relationship between all the prints his, his studio produced that you can say, this is the house style. Yes, yes. And that's probably what you're seeing as the, re the, the release of certain kind of um, authority. I, I think the, too, that, and that became one of the problems that Kitai had with the idea of printmaking, was this idea of the artist hand. You know, as he moved through into the 70s and, and that came to the forefront, drawing from the figure and the human clay and all of those things that he was working on, he shifted and felt that he couldn't be both, that it wasn't right. fair to be driving this yeah. um, bus one way <laughs> and mm -hmm. staying here as well. And I think in the ones that he, he talked about how the ones that were sent that were put together by Prater, he didn't find them as, as successful which I think is questionable, but I think that idea of authorship, that letting go, was very difficult for him. That's, that's not the impression I got. I, I read, you know, that, or in the letter that I read, he was saying, I, I trust you implicitly, you know, you made this decision, but actually that wasn't the case. No, and you know, in, Jane Kinsman did a wonderful catalog of the prints in the early 90s, and he wrote some prefaces to some of them, and he struggled with a lot of them. Um, going back, and I think that disconnect that happened in the 70s brought him there, and then as he grew older and I was working with him, he, he started to revisit them, and I think saw how they had informed what he was doing all along. Well, could you maybe, or I, both of you, either of you tell us a little bit about what was happening in his um, broader painting practice during these years? I mean, uh, were, were the collages influencing the way he was painting, or were, the or were they reflecting paintings that he was already opposed well, to? Well, in my observations of the work, I would say that there is, um, the collages represent, um, while directed, a very spontaneous place in which he, he brings together things, almost as a drawing would happen, in a, but using the, the found material and texture and color in a very spontaneous way to pull these together. Con obviously, by the time, collage happens in three stages. You have a, a ground, which becomes the field in which you work, and then you, you apply objects you find, and you move them around until you glue them down. And the critical step in the spontaneity is how that moment at which the glue stick come, well, it would not have been a glue stick, of course, it would have been a large <laughs> pot of something nasty and white, <laughs> viscous. And you bring it out and slap it down, and then you, you have a moment to move it, or you peel it off and deal with what happens to the paper underneath, and that's the spontaneity. And Kitai observed that this, the collages actually were the moment, one of the most spontaneous moments. But they, they reflect what happens in, is happening in the paintings as he comes out of the Royal Academy, in which he's using um, collage in the paintings physically, as well as a source for thinking about how an image or a text, a word, a fragment of architecture is going to live in the painted matrix. 
you know, so, so that you look at, p at pictures and they, they are, they have the same spirit that you see along the wall here in the collages where there'll be a, a, a geometric passage of color and then there's a, an image that breaks across it, a text that's whole in its rigor of a typewritten text glued down on the painting and then a series of drawn and painted discovered images in the process of painting against the found image. And I think this is him responding to the moment in popular culture when you know, there was this, in the younger generation, this need to express the, the rapidity with which youth culture was taking over uh, the shape and the form and the color and the signs of the uh, popular culture around it. And I think Kitai is a mature person, you know, he's in his late 20s, I guess, and he's looking at this, but he is taking it and pushing it forward. And he, he certainly was not a spontaneous painter. He was very uh, careful in oh, his painting process, and it took a very long time to create a work. So I think when he talked about this, and he talked about this being a spontaneous process, the collage work, um, it's reflected in that. Mm. You know, because you could finish a collage in a day or a couple of days, you come back to it after lunch and then you put it aside and then you come back the next day and then, but you finally paint it, put it down. Whereas a painting could sit on the easel a month or more and you know, suddenly the, the small figure becomes the big figure, the fragment of the hand is left between the legs as you flip the canvas over and change direction. All of those things happening in the painted works versus the collage. The, um the arrangement of the elements, you could argue, though, is actually the, the less spontaneous part of the process and where the real um, chance happens, in, especially in, tradition, in the tradition of surrealist collage, is the selection of images. Mm. Uh, and especially we see it in Paul, Paolozzi's work or Rauschenberg to an extent, there's a sense of a kind of chaos of, of a randomness, of um, absurdity, um, of, of, of just uh, culling from the, the sort of maelstrom of contemporary life. I don't get that sense so much with Kitai's collages. That I, my, my sense is that um, every part of these is carefully selected and intentional. Is that a well, reading you show? Or? No. I have an observation. I would, I, I'm curious what you think, because I, I agree with you. <laughs> Just having known him and how he worked in his process, that I think it was a very careful. He kept folders of images his entire life, which we have now at the archive. Um, his studio floor was covered, but things had relationships. And even when you look at his paintings, I think in composition, how they're put together, there's a collage-like quality of where he's placing different elements of a painting. Um, so I, I do think it was a careful careful process. Oh, I, I think absolutely, because he's, he's too self-conscious about his intellect and his public presentation and the way he wanted things to be discovered, suggest, and around. And there's, there's, a real, there's an interesting relationship in the room, but, but I think in the, in the early work, the difference between Kitai and Rauschenberg, whom, whose work he knew, who had been at the Venice Biennale, who had been shown in, in London at, when Kitai's a student, um, is Rauschenberg is, is truly spontaneous, a little unruly, and it's a bulletin board. He's balancing formal elements, whereas Kitai is balancing things that mean something to him, a text, a reference to a book, an image of Blavatsky or of um, uh, an auth another author whose uh, readings he's doing, a bit of text in which there's a wry or ironic juxtaposition of notion mm -hmm. of gender or m meaning or method. And in those, while they're collaged, he's moving them around until the tension between the word, an image here, and a color block that's somehow intellectually or emotionally related happens. That's where I think he ties it in. Right. I think the use of this window grid. And there are two examples here. There's the collage at this end of this wall, and at the far end of this wall, you see the green version. And what disappears 
is this amazing line of text referencing three authors and a fragment of text, which then, if you, if you begin the endless search, you go up into the windows and b d determine which author it is. He takes it away in the green version, in the edition to print. He decides, no, I don't want to give you quite the whole thing. He liked the riddle, and, and I think the there's, riddle, there's exactly. little hidden yeah. riddles yes. and, and jokes where names won't match images of certain artists yeah. mm -hmm. um, and, and that kind of play. Oh yes, the play of the names in the second mm -hmm. one on this wall, where Picasso is Matisse and Brock is, is Leger, and you know, you think, oh well, that's clever, and there's something <laughs> he's seeing here, it's a, it's a disruption of expectation. It's also probably what made him a great dinner partner. <laughs> he was very funny. <laughs> he was he, right. funny, and the, the reference to this bounced off something someone said, and then, you know, because he's in demand to meet everyone in town at the, some point in his life. They seem extremely literary, and, and in contrast to Rauschenberg, who I guess was arm's length from expressionist painting in the speed and the effect, right. um, we... I think him putting together a picture more like a, a writer would a text or something. Mm -hmm. He famously said, you know, books have pictures and my pictures have books. So. <laughs> no. Or is it There's word, a, a or is strong. It words, is it words and pictures or? Books have, some books have pictures and some pictures have, have books. books. Yes. Right. Um, and I think that piece of, of was so important with that tie to history, which he brought to all of his work. Can you say a bit more about that, and, and, and particularly about his, his Jewishness, the relationship to the text in that respect? Yeah, and I think you know, discovering Abby Warburg at, when he was at Oxford and looking at how he documented um, art history and coming to that as a way to make it new was very important. So he was looking at history through this different lens of interpretation. And then as he evolved with his Judaism, which started with reading about the Eichmann trials. The Eichmann trial in 63. And really came more strongly when he met Sandra Fisher, um, who, who brought him more to, to his belief. And it starts to change the work. You don't see it as much that I don't think in the prints as much as you do in, in the later paintings. No, because I think, I think what you see here it is work that reflects his, his notion of himself as a bibliophile, yes. as a reader. You know, he, his youth was spent in, you know, God, what a gift. He's, a, he's on a, a boat as a seaman, you know, and he's, he's on the trade routes. And for days on end, you do nothing. Someone's steering the boat and all you want to make you know, sure your life raft is close at hand. And he's reading literature. And he falls in, and every city he goes to, he falls into bookshops, and the hands of an of a antiquarian bookseller or a, a bookseller who's involved in poetry, and his, his reading list expands. And he immediately moves it into his work as that layer of something in an age in which we, are de we begin to deny history and we begin to deny um, the common cultural markers Kitai is reinventing and reaching back and pulling it forward. And I think that shows in the painting as well. Yes, the episodic nature of, of single canvases in which, like a good uh, altarpiece, you see the force, four main stories of Christ's life and a saint, and his shines. And in Kitai, he's a modern man, he's a Jew. He begins to make annotations around the perimeter of an image, like a Talmudic scholar who's analyzing the text and writes notes in the margin. It's, there's this wonderful parallel inside it that, is, that reflects a tradition he becomes aware of through Shlom, Shlom and the other Jewish writers. And he reads Walter Benjamin's Unpacking My Library. Yeah, right. which, which he greatly loves. informs yeah, yeah, how he approaches important. text important. and books as objects beyond just what's contained within them. And right. I, there's uh, the In Our Time series, which is yes. just 50 screen prints of book covers that some were from his library, some were collected from friends, really, I, to me, shows that most strongly. But these two, with their text. And uh, hidden meaning yes. as well, yes. or, or private meaning. Yes. I, better to say private meaning. I think for him, it's the private meaning and the public association. You know, 
You're a sm I'm a smart man, I've read this text, but the meaning for me is hidden here. You know, and it, there's a kind of a wonderful parallel in between ego and its extensions and personal life and meaning. Relationship to memory, yeah. too, I think, was very important. Right. So where he was when he picked up that book, where he was when he read that text. Exactly, yes. Uh -huh. Where the text took him, yeah. and then he invents again. You know, so it's, a, it's, it's totally rich, and it, to have such a visual art come out of such a literary beginning and a bent is, is kind of masterful. Right. Which connects, sorry, <laughs> connects too to the poetry he was looking at too. So we think uh, about absolutely. what's happening on, in poetry at this time with the Black Mountain poets and Pound, who Kitai was very fond of, how text is laid on a page. And he talked about some of the prints as poems. So you see this juxtaposition of images that would, might relate to, to that modern poetry format as well. And in fact, the Mahler series is based off of a book of poetry. By, by Jonathan Williams. He was, so Kitto was in Berkeley in, from like 67 <laughs> onwards and hugely immersed in the poetry scenes there, right. which was itself kind of radically experimental. So I can imagine there wasn't a huge gulf between what he was doing and what the, the kind of poets um, he was interested in. Were. No, no, and I, I, th I think he, he, he is very, he reflects very much what modern poetry was about, the Black Mountain School, the West Coast group, you know, where they're, they're taking these divergent um, images and ideas and pushing them together in a series of words on a page which bounce and jump and have gaps and it, without punctuation. You think of Ashbery and people like that, who, or Cummings, who play with the words for its meaning, its image, its association. Yeah. And you come to the end, a place you didn't start. And a Kitai painting will take you someplace you didn't, where you thought you started, but you end somewhere else. Or he's buried something in it, all, always a little physical, always mental, mm. literary, uh, Did scatological. <laughs> Erotic. Yes. These paintings. Of mm -hmm. Did he know Burroughs? Was it, was he did. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, Ginsburg. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we, we talked a lot about poetry and, and, and literature, but also, of course, music. Um, the, the sort of textual annotation of uh, music features in various ways in, in these um, works. Again, it's this sort of a level of encoding and uh, inaccessibility to. You know, like we can all read a poem if it's uh, appropriated and incorporated into a print, but most of us can't tran read music in our heads. So it's this sort of forever. Oh, and God forbid I hum along. It's a nightmare. <laughs> but hum along to a picture. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you know, it, it's an interesting notion because f f Kitai I've always looked at from the late 60s on, I guess, as a as a in part as a mirror of things that are shimmering in the, the cultural and intellectual milieu. And everything he quotes, um, in a way, sets you down a path uh, that is both contemporaneous with the, the moment he creates it, but because of his interest in history, both in art and ideas, it also leads you into a, a kind of crooked path back a bouncing path back, and his library, his letters, his references in the prints, and I, th I think the, the, certainly the paintings, take you to a place. The way he discovers his Judaism, which I think starts with the grandmother, frankly, mm -hmm. Grandmother mm -hmm. Kitai, mm -hmm. who talks about the expulsion from Vienna, the escape, and that, those, those, that narrative which he puts away as a brash young American boy, baseball and girls and cars, yes, yes. and goes to England, and then I, the Eichmann trial happens, and then he begins to think about it, and it, it becomes fascinated, and discovers other things that lead him. There's an it. early print that includes a, called Atchison Go Home, that includes a text from a pamphlet he f says he found on the ground in Vienna, wanting the Secretary of State to go back to the United States, that the Austrians did not want any more US involvement. This was post uh, 
post-war when he was studying in Vienna. Mm -hmm. So I think absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's interesting that you picked up on the music because he did the, a series of prints called Some Poets that highlights most of the Black Mountain as well as Duncan, um, but also includes Martin Feldman, who is a composer. Yes. So I think that was combinations of what was happening mm -hmm. in, in music as well as mm -hmm. the modern poetry, absolutely. Can we talk a bit about the kind of status of these objects? You know, um, uh, collage involves um, the destruction of, 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 of source material. You're cutting and tearing, and if the, the sources are books, then you are transgressing the number one rule of the, any bibliophile will, you know, respect to the, to the book, the publication. Um, so there is this kind of violence or, or trauma that's often implied in, in the process. Where, what were his material sources? You know, other, other artists at the time were taking from uh, mass media, you know, these valueless, yes, um, right. Right, valueless sort of uh, newspapers and magazines and stuff. We don't see that so much here. We even see... Um, family photographs, yeah. original family photographs in a piece down here. Um, his books, were they original? Were they his actual copies that he was cutting up? No, yeah. I, I don't believe so. And I think if they were, they were, he'd found another copy that was in better condition. He was right. so, the books were very precious as objects. And I think a lot of it does come from mass media of what he was looking at, of which magazines he was reading. And I know he had Life magazine and other magazines come in. And I think, too, this idea of, of the photo reproduction of his own work that he would have enlarged or reduced and then tear up the photo and reuse it, too. So he was mm. reworking his own paintings and drawings in a different way. Yes, which is how you see in these two small collages here, which are some of my favorite things in the show. You see uh, images that then have appeared in the, the print next door four times the size, five times the size. They get restructured. And there are things you can find in the early paintings that turn up in the prints um, three years later. Right. And it's because he, he, he takes this, m this very contemporary proper, uh, opportunity, this, these photo copies at that point, not, not digitally printed, not today where we take an image and we spin it out into a hundred different sources stretched and things. But here, he's using them and using them again. And, and it, Prater's skill set gave him that option. And then the financial support every artist would have killed for this kind of thing, who were paying for Prater's time to source old wallpaper and to make 27 color films and then passes with the press and then to have the pre print not make the grade for Kitai and be scuttled. You know, it's, it's, very, it's a very exciting and interesting way of being free, being spontaneous. Right. Do you think he was um, liberated by the fact that it was a, this was a relatively low medium, as it were? Or do you think he was trying to elevate this sort of commercial low medium into something that was more akin to a painting, uh, you know, that had evidence of his hand in uh, and, and painted marks. I think when we look at the time that these were created, he was not in his London studio much of this time. He mm. was traveling, he was in LA, he was in Berkeley. So you know, the, the ease of production as opposed to setting up a painting studio. Uh, he was staying at a beach house in Truncas when he was at UCLA and was able to create a lot of the collage there. Right. Um, so I just think yeah. that ease of use was a big piece. Oh, yes, and it, it, it was a connectivity back to a, a creative community and a set of, of ideas that he was very involved with. It, collage and watercolor are two things that traveling artists always find a way of doing, you know, and amateurs do it as well, the ticket stub and the, you know. Right. It was probably his most inventive time as far as right. what one can use for materials. He was also at this point with doing art and tech at LACMA and created sculpture that are unlike any other Kitai work you'll ever see. Oh. So it was a time when I think that experimentation, he was thinking about things in different ways right. and then kind of returned later on to that more traditional approach. Yeah, it's, it's a period that we don't think about, but it turns out Maurice Tuckman to you know, 
put a Kitai show together in 1965, late 65 at LACMA. It was his first, LA had the first introduction um, outside of New York to Kitai's work in America. And then he invites him back to be part of art and technology, which I don't think was terribly successful for Kitai, but it, some of it shows up, and in some place, in one of the things, I think in a print in the back room, yes. there's part of the those computer-generated computer mm -hmm. drawing no, things. Yeah. No. Well, it's, a, it's an exciting way f to work, and for him, it kept him focused, because teaching draw drawing in Berkeley and UCLA, uh, the kind of mass culture shift the alternative culture shift among students and the world around him was distracting. His personal life was in flux. The collages represented a portable, mobile way of, of making the day count, of making the kind of connections with what he read, what he felt, and what he saw. Right. And there's a genuine sense of play and especially humor. You yes. know, some of these are laugh out loud funny. Uh, and, you know, you see at the back, the way he's added the beard to the photograph of the woman, it's um, a kind of irreverent gesture. Uh, and some of the wordplay, the, the mislabeling of famous artists um, with other artist names. Um, is, does that come out of not taking it too seriously or being taking it extra seriously? I mean, being, being completely energized by the possibilities. We don't see that kind of humor in his paintings or drawings too much, do we? Mm, some of the paintings, yeah. I think so. <laughs> okay, okay, I yeah. think so, I think, you know. From this period, or? Maybe, more, maybe a little later, yeah. they're right. a little bit more playful. Um, yeah. And in the, in the title, so that word play has always been very important to him. Right, right. And, and it's in the word play and in the juxtaposition in these prints and the collages that generate the prints that you find that humor and that kind of American irreverence. I mean, right. you know, because here's a man, an American, working in London, coming back to America. America has changed since he left. I mean, the difference between the, the mid-50s and the mid-60s is a, on the West Coast versus the mid-50s in New York an entirely different world has happened. The, the definition of how an artist enters the world, what an art is constituted by, has changed. And he comes into it with having immersed himself in the British attitude about history and process and the progress of empire and art history and being. And he comes to the West Coast untethered in some ways emotionally by what's going on in his personal life, and he begins these, makes some of these collages in a very inventive way. He orders them with a grid. He orders them with architecture. It's a very interesting thing. That happens in the early paintings. It does. Mm -hmm. And so the, 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 the grid-based kind of look at them, which I, I think is also partly Chris Prater. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, too, that he would certainly have said that painting and drawing were more important in his work than these. He, would, right. he certainly would have. That, and he came back to that at the end of this period. Um, I, I, I was sort of thinking about like the weight of history, the this, this fact that he was reading and thinking about sacred texts, but also do you some way like defile or dis, you know, um, uh, Despoil the text by using it in a in a collage, by cutting it up, by cutting it out. Spoken as a true author. Ha! No, I, I, no, it's grist for the mill, Jonathan. Please, it's just paper, and there are more copies. You find the cover of the book, you'll find it again. The used bookstores are full of them. You know, so you chop them up, use them, eat them. Um, okay, I take that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, another way of asking something similar, when he uses another artist's work or another artist's image or even an artist's name in his work, are we dealing with a kind of homage or are we dealing with uh, critique or even satire? I mean, there's this, this humour, this play combined with, you know, labelling Picasso as Brock or whatever. We see an irreverence. It, I, I think what you see is, is an insider art joke. 
you know, right. uh, Picasso, who was, you know, in the world of art history, elevated above Brock, is labeled Brock, and it's a, a little kind of leveling of a playing field uh -huh. on one level and one interpretation. Yeah. You know, but he 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 loved. He those had great artists. respect for the, for the canon oh. and, and yes. referred to them well, repeatedly. Yeah. I was. Think you know, there's there's so many famous names, not just painters, yes. but, but writers and and composers too. Almost as if he's thinking about notoriety, fame, in it all, in and of itself. I mean, that's about as much as we get from um, a work like this behind me, where we sort of uh, sheet music. We recognise the name of the composer, but maybe not the name of the piece of music, and certainly don't know what it sounds like. Um, is that something, you know, was he interested in, well, you say interested in the canon, but was he competitive in terms of his own position? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Yeah. And he was, a, he was a great list maker and would list, you know, all the p important people who had informed his practice. He had certainly those that he turned to. Right. And they were this cast that shows up again and again in drawing and painting and in the prints. Right. And his writings. And his writings. And, you know, it's, he, he knew exactly the coffee shop to go to and to sit at. It was the only one. And he had a list of, of heroes and heroines, mostly heroes. Yeah. You know, and it's, but he's a man of his time. He is, he is a person who is, mirroring and opening the door to what was the, the, the culture of art and the canon of that what this art came out of, the series of ideas. And later in his life, it becomes very important that you, you understand that he is calling forth the names of those who've gone before mm -hmm. to honor and to put himself in the list. I think when you say of, of his time, I think too that there's a hearkening back to a search for a community that he didn't feel existed in this time and in this yes. place necessarily. So turning to the writings, turning, finding that peer group mm. that he felt he could relate to. Yeah, yes. so is this like him distancing himself to an extent with the, his peers? I mean, I know the pop artists, many of them mm. were younger than him. Yeah. Um, no? Well, I, I feel there's a very strong thread throughout the whole thing, and it, reflect, it reflected in the way I approached the show that I did in Portland, that Kitai is an outsider mm -hmm. from the beginning. He is a child whose father disappears. He, he, he bonds with another man who marries his wife. Who is, he has two marriages. He, he's, he is an American operating in England. I know how you're treated as an American operating in England, yeah, you know. <laughs> and then if you're Jewish, you find another thing. And so he's always at a distance. When he comes to the States, he's in, even in Berkeley, he would have been considered intellectually precocious or pretentious. And he would have been an outsider. He would have clipped his speech a little. He would be, you know, he'd look like an American boy, but he would have been slightly outside. He goes back to England. I mean, he's always outside. So this idea of the larger community, the larger, the, the, this bubble in which we participate in our minds and our hearts and physically becomes so important for him. He's always looking for that place. Coming back to LA at the final decade of his life is another way of finding a place that he thought he could could draw the final circle to become himself in, wrapped in, in a family that through all time still loved him and wanted him to be part his, of their life. His, his family and his books. That's right. <laughs> his right. libraries. Could you say something a little bit about um, this, the turn that happened in his work uh, around the mid to late 70s, uh, the reasons that he Put printmaking aside and collage. Uh, the British Art Council asked him in the 70s to uh, buy art for them. As that was their practice, they would ask an artist to collect for them uh, for a year. And he said he would do it as long as he would be given uh, permission to only buy figurative art. So it had to represent the figure. And this was at a time where he was starting to return to the argument for life drawing in art school with Hockney. So all of this about the hand being so important. And he really felt that this 
reproduction process didn't lend itself to that. And I think while he enjoyed it, felt that this, his strengths need to, to go in this new direction. Do you think his um, awareness of the limitations of this medium as he perceived them, or frustration with the medium led no, to those? No, I, I just think a belief or? system. <laughs> He, uh, the exhibition, The Human Clay, he put together at that time. Mm -hmm. I think it was just such a strong belief in his process, his idea of painting drawing that he was developing, mm -hmm. that couldn't be realized in the prints. And, and so he moved on from yeah. it. But I don't think it was you know, a disdain for it or, or anything like that. Yeah, I, I think there's a trajectory that reinforces what Tracy said, that is, um, he spends his time in America teaching life drawing. He, he talks about the value of the hand. His original degree um, was about drawing and about the, the mastery of the hand. And he comes to figuration at a time when America has embraced first abstract expressionism. He leaves the country and goes to a place where he can study the figure and the tradition of landscape and figurative painting. Mm -hmm. He chooses that over that. So he, he makes a commitment to figuration, which does, in the photomechanical process, takes him too far away from it. Takes him away from the hand and the, uh, the eye, the kind of direct engagement. It wasn't a lot of gray area with Kitai. It was right. usually one way or the other. <laughs> and so he, I think that strong conviction that this was the new direction he was going. You know, and it, it was not valued. I mean, there's a moment I'm always reminded of Dubuffet when I look at those two black background pieces where the floating bits are like uh, 60s Dubuffet kind of moments with these rock stones and, and figures. But it, there is a sense where, you know, Freud and Bacon and um, Giacometti and Dubuffet are outsiders in the New York American scene, but they are, because they're figuratively based, even if they're quite abstract, de Kooning himself is a little figurative, but mostly it's, it's about the joy of abstraction and formalism. Rauschenberg, who never, never gives up the figure, but he only uses it as a reproduction. Kitai takes the other position and values that moment. And so screen printing's not such a good thing for him. It doesn't engage in the way. And he did move on to etching and lithography, which right. he continued up until his death. Right. Traditional so, exactly. media. Exactly. Where he could draw, and he had developed a, right. a lithographic process where he would actually draw on a piece of paper in the studio and then okay. give it to the printmaker. Yeah. So it was very direct. And, and they were often portraits and self-portraits and, and reflective of something that... Biblical figures. Right. So it was a, a very different take. And he did ask Marlboro not to show his prints anymore. He, he kind of cut them off in the late 70s and the 80s. And then as Jane Kinsman began to put together the catalog resume, started to revisit them. Mm. Yeah. I mean, to me, these look so contemporary, uh, mm. many of them. And uh, it's oh, yeah. so interesting to see that they were part of the relation to modernism that he, he put aside um, in favor of something more timeless or uh, even traditional. And he'd kept them, so he moved them from London to Los Angeles in packages, and we unpacked them and put right. them into flat files and interleafed them and signed the ones that hadn't been signed, so they obviously still had value to him. Mm -hmm. And then he began a gift to the British Museum of every print he'd ever done before his death, and they now hold, they did an updated catalog resume and house every single print that we know of. <laughs> Be because they still reflect the core of who he was at the time becoming and who, who then used this as the foundation, palette, words, images, ideas, you know, this notion of the, the crossword, the visual crossword that these become, like a pattern that you find. Mm -hmm. he, he carries into the imagery associative and elusive in the paintings of the, uh, of the late 70s when he resets up his painting studio and he, he pushes himself into painting in a fulsome way. And the shows that happen and the, and the paintings that come out of that studio experience, uh, they take so much time and energy and focus that the collage then is not the thing. He's doing some sketches, he'll make drawings and then paint. He had in the, in the LA studio up on the wall, Prater had done a few pulls on canvas of some of the prints yeah. that he'd requested. And there's, there's one, one down here. There, yeah. And he had some up and he would draw on them and glue new things to them <laughs> and change right. them again. So he was still 
still thinking about it as a surface and as a process, most uh -huh. definitely, uh -huh. just in a different way. Yeah, coming back in the present mm -hmm. to his his past and re re energizing it and re energizing himself to look forward, which I think is interesting. I mean, I for me this shows a treat because they are so surprising. You know, there's almost like this yes. time capsule yeah. that connects me to uh, an artist I, I didn't think I knew. Um, and as I say, they feel strikingly of now, ironically, you know, uh, of, of today. Well, it's these, the way he would see a, f a fragment of something and isolate it and then push it against the kind of imagery that we see now, these, these kind of colored shapes and this fragment and then a, a bit of something. It's, you know, post David Sale and, and, right. and Peter Halley and somehow it gets shuffled into something else. And so we're ready to look at this. We're ready to see these fresh in terms of how we are seeing young artists coming out of schools who are playing with this, the power of an image against abstraction. And appropriation and switch, right. channel switching right. and uh, overload, I think yes. we're oh, yes. sadly familiar with today. Um, does anyone have any questions, things that they'd like to ask, preferably these guys, but any of us, um, things we haven't covered? Yes. Uh, oh, and could we, um, yes, uh, take the microphone <laughs> so we can hear on the recording. Actually, yes, I do have a question, but it's sort of outside of collage theme only. It's, uh, yeah, reading his autobiography, I got sense of dark energy uh, he possessed last, at least last years of his life. Maybe you, Tracy, got idea what really happened at that date exhibition and after that, which made him so bitter. Big one. <laughs> I'll start with, you know, knowing him in a very personal way, I don't think he was bitter. I, I don't think that, I wouldn't choose, you know, he was wonderful to work for. He was very kind. I brought babies to work with me and he loved them. Um, he was a very generous person. His family meant everything to him. Um, he loved nothing more than being with his sons. Um, so I think that 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 played a big role. I, I do think, you know, Sandra's death, certainly, and its relationship to what happened with the Tate exhibition weighed on him. You know, I, I can't get in his head exactly, but I'm sure that there's guilt and all those feelings that happen when you lose a spouse in such a tragic way. So there was certainly that. But when I look at those late paintings and the color on those canvases and the self-portraits, I see something so beautiful that I, I don't see the bitterness, but I had a very different relationship than how it was portrayed to the world. And I think that Tate War, we're, we're trying to get over that Tate War and that idea and, and move on from there. Absolutely. And I'm so glad that you read the book <laughs> because it's, it's difficult to read. And to me, it's like a collage. It, it repeats yes. itself. There's a lot going on, a lot of layers. Um, but it, to me, it was another work of art. It wasn't a piece of literature so much. Right. So I'm glad you read it. <laughs> You're welcome. Hi, Derek. <laughs> you said something about um, Utai's collection of Cezanne prints. Ah. And why he did that. And he had, a, I understand, a complete collection of every Cezanne print that he produced. Cezanne was his god. <laughs> and I think that was an accessible way to have him in his home. So he had a room in the house in Westwood that was the Cezanne library, which included the prints, um, which he acquired over, the, over time at auction. Was he collecting during this period, or was it mm -hmm. much later? It would have been later, I yeah. believe. Mm -hmm. But he probably had a larger collection of Cezannes in most museums. He may have. Most Complete set of the prints. No, mm -hmm. no, no. That was wonderful. One of my favorite room in the house. It was beautiful. <laughs> well, and he used them compositionally. He used the, you know, the, uh, you know, so it, it, it infused several of the late paintings and also the, the 80s pictures. One of his very first prints is, um, I think it's called Walter Kittai in the Garden, yes. which is very much informed from him looking at Cezanne as a student in Oxford. 
and it was done at a, he was just experimenting with printmaking in the very early stages while he was in Oxford. Yeah, and it, it, he, he, he's fond of saying that, you know, quoting Picasso and Matisse, both of whom credited Cezanne as the father of their art, and he joined them in a wholehearted and spirited and did, way. The whole Los Angeles series of painting is based off of uh, Cezanne comp compositions. Oh. Yeah. Why would you think that he felt Cezanne was his god? Why would you think that he felt Cezanne was his god and a lot of those guys felt Cezanne was their only master? So, well, to begin with, it's a matter of opinion. Um, and artists are the best source of both uh, un uh, of what has motivated them and what they choose to be associated with that has no relationship to their work. I, as you know, as a curator, I've always found you have to balance those things. But Cezanne, for many of them, represented someone who worked um, at first in some isolation, who was able to translate um, into formal terms his personal. Um, feelings and the sense of the person or the place, the great mountain pictures, Saint Victoire, where the, the wind of the place is in the brush of the artist's hand. And you, we experience even today those, those things. And so for these artists who abandoned the sense of a place in which your art is rooted and your feet stand, they come back to him because of the clarity formally and emotionally he was able to convey. He continues to inspire artists because of that. Um, but it's a, you know, it's a specific moment in modernism. And two, the, 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 how the figure is depicted in, yes. in something like yeah. the Great Bather's painting at the National Gallery. I think being able to be so painterly and yet push the boundaries of what we think of when we look at figurative painting was something that Kitai found extremely exciting. This idea that you could change and, and transform into something new. Yeah. Remaining no, in those no. confines. Paul. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of a, a quotation of uh, Kundera where he says that the European is someone who longs for Europe. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> in many ways, I think Kitai longed for a certain Middle Europa Europe particularly the middle Europa of Benjamin and, and of uh, Scholem and others. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you can add something to that perception. In the Kinsman book, he, there's a great line from Kitai where he talks about, and I don't know if it's still up in the office or not, that the print, The Red Dancer of Moscow, is like walking down the street of the best European city and looking into the windows and doors and that entryway, absolutely, into that community. And it's a complicated community because it is very much a community shaped by Jewish intellectuals and um, artists. And you know that initial introduction he has through his that year, that summer, that year he studies in Vienna with Wotubra and, and learns drawing and and is taught by the teacher by this last student of Sheila, where he he, he embraces something there. But it is the stories about the streets and the life that he and his first wife met there, I think is interesting. I, I just remember, if, if I if may just take, go down memory lane, when I, when I met Kitai, um, he opened the door and we spent three hours in his Jewish library. Yes. <laughs> and after three hours, he asked me if I wanted something to drink. <laughs> <laughs> orange juice, probably. <laughs> <laughs> it was California. <laughs> it was always orange juice. <laughs> Just to go back to the imagery in these collages and prints, um, you mentioned at the very beginning that he used a lot of repeated imagery in different scales and sizes, but I'm wondering in the context of the text, if there's an, if they can be read iconographically, if you thought about them in that way. Do you think they're coherent in I, that way? I, don't, I think they're almost more imagery than text to be read mm -hmm. in, in my experience. That, how they lay on the page and the line. I think they have meaning in their subject in a broad way, but I don't know if that's specific. And I don't think it's consistent across the whole print or through the whole image. 
you know, because you, you know, the, some of them quote so broadly a half dozen sources that you have to then link, is it because this talks about a, a man journeying here and the child born there, what, what do you link? And I think that the, the best of this kind of work, which um, we see a lot in the 60s, uh, this billboard, this kind of um, pictograph and imagery and word text that combine, are about the place they leave you um, and for the artist, all of them associative, but they, they lead to a point that is not definable. And the text, I think, serves that purpose. Yeah. Um, his imagery is so much more enigmatic than like pop artists, right, that he's usually associated with. So right. there's like a, a poetry to the, his image choice. Yes, I guess absolutely. Oh, yeah. I think it's a, uh, philosophers and photographers. There's a specific print that he calls a poem. That there's three lines to the poem, and mm -hmm. this is the first line, and this is the mm -hmm. second, and they are all different. And absolutely, right. Right. thank you. Oh. Oh. Uh, thank you. This has been a wonderful um, evening and uh, incredibly interesting. Um, I should say my name is James Scott and. I made a film on Kitai in 1967. And uh, one of the things that I remember him talking about at the time then was very much his interest in socialism. And he said that he was, in a way, cursed to be a socialist. Um, I always felt there was incredible contradictions in the way he looked at things around him. And, of course, you have to remember that at the time, politically, there was uh, Vietnam War and you know everything that had come out. One of the prints, I think, that I found very interesting and I'd, perhaps you could say more about was White Rose because that print um, brought together a number of things about uh, Nazism. And that always seemed to be a thread through his work, too. And, the way that he sort of said that the Catholics were the only people that stood up to the Nazis. I thought that was interesting. So I wondered if you could say a bit more about that. The title to that is a direct reference to the Williams poem, which is, I think, uh, com Comrade, We Need a Byron in the Movement. Yes. And it's from the Mahler series, um, which depicts the siblings. I'm going to get the last name wrong. Hannah, I'm drawing a blank. Mm -hmm. who initiated the White Rose uh, movement in Germany and were executed. Yes. Um, and I, th I think he found that exactly that, looking to who is caring for whom in that process and, and, and did look at politics a lot, especially in the early work, um, references to Vietnam and references certainly to um, World War II. But yeah, it's a, it's a very, that whole suite has underlying currents um, there's one, I don't think we have it here, with, with rat hands and human hands laid out in a grid formation that's very haunting and um, that speaks to that time as well. One of the things that struck me was that he actually, because the movement was called the White Rose, yes. and he said he, he went and looked for a white rose, which I thought is interesting because in a way it's sort of the opposite to the idea that spontaneous and it just came out in the studio and there it was. It yeah. was actually very, very well thought out and very well researched and there was a, a definite meaning behind and story. And I think with those Mahler prints in particular, because they were coming out of poetry, they have very specific references. And he would collect daily and, and up to the time I was with him, if something was of interest to use again, he would tear it out and put it in his bag and, and carry it home to put in the studio. Mm. So he was thinking of those themes and those ideas constantly in what he was reading. He had a very structured day that included reading and collecting. Does that answer it, kind of? <laughs> well, yes, but in fact, I mean, then he did the painting about fantasy too. But his mind seemed to, uh, I mean, we've talked a lot about the aesthetics, but in a way, there were a lot of contradictions which seemed to be there, which in a sense uh, they tortured him. Yes. <laughs> um, and I wondered, you know, if you could 
say a bit more about that? I know that it's such a different time from that, that period that it, it's hard for me to speak to that because he didn't talk about it. I only know it through the work. Um, and I, I think after he came to Los Angeles and what happened at the Tate, this idea of these pictures full of information, he kind of changed course and was focusing on the painting and drawing. But he, definitely he was a man with, with strong ideas and convictions um, who was trying to find that balance somewhere between this intellectualism and, um, and the practical, I guess. So. Yeah, and the, the work always is an embrace of, um, of the, the core of the canon of the intellectual life of the artist and his need to integrate that with the spontaneity of the emotional reaction of the libido and the ego and keeping those things as they balance back and forth across text and idea. Um, and then as it's, it's clear to me in looking at specifically because of the Jewish Museum, how he embraces and buries himself and finds another self inside something that starts in 63 with a reawareness as a classic non-practicing Jewish American boy. He begins to find a core of something that uh, many people find it as they life evolves and they suffer loss and celebration and I think that that changes over time these prints are the beginning place at which he finds the trying to balance between text and honoring the text and violating it creating the image and reinventing the image again and again through the spontaneity and the refining and then the, the freezing of the image as a silkscreen print. Because what starts as a spontaneous fluid thing has to become at the end of the day a set piece, you know, and it stops. And, and it's then its life changes because we look at it and we're confused by the narratives, we're, we're titillated by the image, we find the allusion to a text that we've, we've heard of but we've never read, an invitation. And that ultimately is the brilliance of Kitai, that he was, as a responder to the world around him, um, not a sponge as much as a filter. Things come to him, came to him he found something and then he pushed it forward in an association with other things that he had discovered through and in the paintings as images, in the prints as, as compendiums. He found a voice that changed the direction of European yar, art and I think because of where he was in the, in the 60s and how important artists that I met in Germany thought Kitai was to how they developed German uh, neo-expressionism and new imagery and what you see in America and he is one of the pinnacles in many ways uh, at the same time he's this brash ginger bear out of you know, the middle Midwest who <laughs> discovers something else <laughs> I, let's I think we have to leave <laughs> let's it there, go. let people get home uh, to their loved ones. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Bruce Grimm, for Grace of Art. Thank, thank you very, very, very much. That was extraordinary to Jonathan Griffin, Tracy Bartley, and Bruce Grimm. Thank you.